Now, that was hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a diastolic heart failure. Uh, in dogs, you're going to see systolic heart failure, commonly referred to as congestive heart failure. And if I've not told you this before, congestion, you ever hear the, 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 cold, the cold remedies and they say, are you congested? Uh, this sort of thing, you can't breathe. Congestion just means a lot of blood in the tissues, so vasodilated, engorged tissues. And uh, in systolic heart failure, because of the fluid and sodium retention, there's a volume overload and the blood vessels are full of blood and hence the name congested or congestive heart failure. If it's a small breed dog, you're going to probably encounter mitral valve disease. It's very common. Uh, Cavalier King Charles uh, have a really high incidence of it. They're trying to breed it out of, of uh, that particular line uh, as it does seem to be genetically linked. But any of the small breeds can have it. The larger breeds, the Danes, the Dobies, Irish Wolfhounds, they tend to have idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. Okay. <laughs> now, how these present uh, varies. You can have mitral valve typically starts uh, as relatively mild, a cough, exercise intolerance, and then progress to full-blown heart failure. You're more likely to see a dilated cardiomyopathy in a fulminant acute presentation. They're often much further advanced in their heart failure when they come into the clinic here and a uh, much shorter lifespan once they're diagnosed. I'm going to walk you through uh, mainly mitral valve disease uh, because it, it allows us to um, deal with each drug as it's sequentially applied. And I have a case um, presentation I'll show you uh, in, in a little bit. Now, in mitral valve disease, in humans, they go in and replace the valves. They put in a pig valve or a synthetic artificial valve, and that's great, okay? We can do that in dogs. The surgery is not the problem. I mean, it's involved. You have to have uh, heart bypass equipment. The problem is they never can or could get the anticoagulant regulated properly. So they'd end up dying either of um, thromboembolism or hemorrhage. So it hasn't worked out. So pretty well uh, in both these systolic heart failures, we uh, have to address the um, over-exaggerated uh, compensations that are occurring that are worsening the disease. So let's talk first about those compensations. So you have heart failure, which is going to reduce your cardiac output and reduce your blood pressure. That's going to do a, a few things. That reduced um, uh, blood pressure, one, is going to activate the sympathetic nervous system, okay? So your catecholamines, your epinephrine, and your norepinephrine are going to kick in, and they're going to cause vasoconstriction. This is arteriolar. There's also some venous vasoconstriction. But on the arteriolar side, that's going to vasoconstrict. Now, uh, that raises your blood pressure, which is the reason the sympathetic nervous system is doing that. That's a good thing. However, it also increases your total peripheral resistance. <coughs> and that's called afterload. That's, afterload is the pressure the left side of the heart has to overcome to push the blood out of the ventricle. So that can become excessive and increase the work on the heart and decrease the cardiac output. So initially it's good to raise the blood pressure, but when it becomes over-exaggerated, it makes it more difficult for the left ventricle to push things out. At the same time, uh, the sympathetic nervous system is having some effect on the venous side, but this reduced renal perfusion is going to activate renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And I'll go through that in a little bit more detail when we talk about the ACE inhibitors. But basically this leads to salt and water retention. And this is why we call it again congestive heart failure. We've got all this extra blood now. 
from the sodium and water retention. And that uh, overload is called preload. So preload is the amount of blood returning to the right side of the heart. All right. Now, why is that a problem? I said why afterload is a problem. Why is preload a problem? Okay. <clears throat> Remember, according to the Frank Starling law, the greater your preload, the greater your cardiac output. And that's true to a point. It has to do with how much overlap of the cardiac actin and myosin occur. All right. When you get moderate, you see the more stretch of this, uh, the greater the cardiac output. All right. So when you have an optimum stretch, you have optimum cardiac output. But the, <laughs> you reach a point where the stretch is too much, and those actin and myosin fibers are losing contact. Okay, and then you have a detrimental effect. Your cardiac output actually drops. Okay, so it's this overstretching of the myocardium that causes the heart failure. And this uh, is a vicious uh, cycle, vicious circle. The uh, greater the heart failure, the greater the compensatory mechanisms, the greater the preload, the greater the stretch, the the worse the heart failure, the greater the uh, overstimulation, the worse the preload, et cetera. So what starts off early on, we have what we call compensated heart failure, where uh, we're maintaining cardiac output by increasing preload and afterload. But where our clinical signs start to occur, then we're in decompensated heart failure, and we've got excessive afterload and excessive preload. And by the way, this chronic stretch is also physically damaging the, uh, the myocardium. It is causing it to remodel and scar. Uh, so you actually see uh, pathologic changes uh, on histopath of the myocardium. <clears throat> so what uh, do we do? Since we can't replace the valves and on dilated cardiomyopathy, we don't call, know the cause, so we can't really do anything there, obviously. Everything we do in veterinary medicine is aimed at blunting these over-exaggerated compensatory mechanisms. Okay. So we're going, what are the things we can do? We can decrease preload. We can decrease afterload. We can increase the force of contraction. So that's, we're going to use a positive inotropic drug. We're going to slow the heart rate when the rate's excessive. And usually uh, this progresses to where we have pulmonary edema that we need to address as well. All right, so let's talk about some.